the commercial room of a small provincial hotel. The setting for the story of strange happenings in room number 17. The doors were all locked. She'd been round and locked them herself. But she was quite certain she saw a tall, thin figure glide past her across the room and vanish. Oh, go on, old man. She was having you. Not a bit of it. She was second cousin of an aunt of mine by marriage. Very sensible woman, soul of truth and honour. Mind, I don't believe in ghost stories myself. Doesn't sound like it. Oh, look here, old man. I don't think we've met. Rafferty, fancy goods. Don't often pass this way. Usually save the crown, <laughs> but there wasn't a hope tonight. Uh, not surprised, the town's packed. Well, I'm Braithwick, a knitwear. This is Peel. Kitchen furnishings. How do you do? Yes, you're right. King's head for me every time. A daft girl at my office forgot to make a booking. And they won't even look at me. <laughs> Too bad. But uh, I didn't mean to interrupt in that. Ah, oh, it's all right. No, what I was about to say, from the journalistic point of view... I thought you said you... I, I was once advertisement manager of the Bradford Woolen Goods Journal before I came on the road. Hi. And speaking from the journalistic point of view, I hold that when it comes to ghost stories, they've all been written over and over again. But when it comes to a bit of realism, then what's needed is an open mind. Realism. That's what the public wants nowadays. Now look at some of these plays they put on. I sometimes wonder what the public's coming to if that's the sort of thing ah, that they... you never can tell with the public. It's like in the fancy business. You never know how it's going to be one month into the next. Yeah, that depends who you are. Huh? Hmm? Uh -huh. name of Little. Oh, how do you do? Uh, how, how do you do? You're a regular here? Oh, I wouldn't say that. Off and on, you know. What I mean is, if you've got the right push about you, you can make anything go. Oh, true enough. Now, that story you were just telling, now that's supposed to be true. But to me... I assure you, old chap, my aunt's cousin... Oh, I'm not casting aspersions. I just mean, to me, it wasn't real because there weren't half enough details there. You didn't say when it happened or what the room was like. Well, you can't expect... Or that. what happened afterwards. What I like is a story about what a man's seen himself. I'm with you there. Now, I could tell you a story. Not another ghost. Hallucinations, that's all it is. No, no, let him go on. Well, if you like. At any rate, it's not one of these somebody fancied they saw a kind of a something stories. Everything I'm going to tell you is as plain and straightforward as a timetable. Plainer than some. <laughs> Let's hear it, then. Well, to start with, did any of you know Robert Hatteras... Hatteras? Uh, what line? Well, I forget now. He was on the road a good many years. Mm, never heard of him. Well, it doesn't matter anyway. Well, he was a good chap. XRAF. Big moustache, you know. Mind you, I didn't know him myself. I never heard of him. What happened took place at a certain commercial hotel. I won't give it a name because that sort of thing gets about. Uh-huh. Whether he did it himself, nobody knew. But they found him on his bedroom floor with his throat cut. Well, some time later... Yeah, hey, hold on. What was all that about not filling in the details? <laughs> ah, you got me there. Well, there wasn't anything specially rum about the room, I believe. Now, let's see, there was a sort of French bed with carvings all over it and a big black wardrobe the size of a hearse with a glass door and a sort of oriental mirror with a black frame screwed up between the windows. Oh, yeah, and a picture of the Feast of Belshazzar over the mantelpiece. Uh, what? The pardon, old man? Oh, uh, uh, nothing. Go on. Ah, let's hear the story. Well, as I was saying, some time later I found myself in, in... But I'd better not mention the name of the town either. I found my firm had booked me into that very hotel. It was full. But there was quite a crowd of us in the commercial room after dinner. I got chatting to a fellow in the antiques line. Very pleasant chap. Cooper, I think he was called. The place is pretty full tonight, Mr Cooper. Oh, I've seen it worse. What room you got, Little? In number 17. 17? Oh, oh, you wouldn't catch me in there. Oh, why? Thought they'd closed it up. That's the room where the chaps cut their throats. Eh? Yes, chap called Bert Hatteras began it. You haven't heard about him? Oh, yes, yes, I did hear. Oh, but since? Since? Why, was there something else? Every man who slept in that room since has cut his throat. Just like poor old Bert. You're... Kidding. Well, I'm exaggerating a bit, maybe. There's only been two more. Two? Three, counting old Bert. 
And I'll tell you another thing. Yes? Every one of them was a commercial. Oh, you going now? Uh, uh, yes. Well, uh, just a breath of fresh air before I turn in. Well, pleasant dreams, old man. Oh, can I help you, Mr Little? Uh, yes, you, uh, you wouldn't by any chance. Yes? Any hope of changing my room? Well, we are rather full. Doesn't it suit you, then? No, it's just that, uh, uh, well, you see, it's over the bar, and I thought I'd like to get an early night. Anything would do. Well... Oh, there's number 16. It might be a little bit quieter. I'm afraid well, I'll that's take all, it. Though. I'll shift my own things. I'm sorry to be a trouble. <laughs> she, she didn't let on she knew why you wanted to swap over then. Well, I thought she gave me a bit of a funny look, that's all. Well, let's see the rest. Well, I shifted my things. I didn't altogether like the idea of being next door to number 17, but there was nothing else for it. It wasn't till I was taking my collar and tie off that I realised about the furniture. Well, what about it? Well, I hadn't taken much notice of the things in number 17, but in my new room I suddenly saw that the bed had carving all over it, that there was a great wardrobe the size of a hearse, and a sort of oriental mirror screwed up between the windows. Go on. Yes, and the feast of Belshazzar over the mantelpiece. You mean... I saw that although I hadn't got number 17 anymore, I'd got all the furniture that had been in number 17 when Bert Hatteras was done in. Ah, oh, but that made you feel good, eh? I don't mind admitting, amongst ourselves, that when I got back in number 16 again, I looked under the bed and inside the wardrobe. Anybody hide in there? No, nothing. Just a minute, though. Everything you've told us so far about this chap Hatteras and so on, well, it was only hearsay, wasn't it? Uh, that's the point. Yeah, it's quite true. I don't ask you to believe any of it. But what I'm going to tell you now is my part of the story. What happened to me in that room? Well, we're all ears. And I'll admit I had a bit of a struggle with myself. I smoked a pipe and I read the evening paper right the way through. Advertisements and all. And then I told myself it wasn't in my room, but in the one next door that it had happened. And at last I... Went to bed. Bet you left the light on. No, I can't sleep with the light on. Did you sleep? Like a top. Until... Until something woke me up. Just a little sort of... tapping noise. Who... Who's there? Who is it? They told me you'd be in number 17. Who are you? What do you want? You're Mr. Little, aren't you? What if I am? Who are you? Night Porter, sir. Your early call. Oh. It's after six. Early... Oh. You did want a call, sir. I've been knocking and knocking next door, you see. Only nobody never told me you moved. Oh, or... yes. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thank you very much. That young thing on the desk, if I tell her once, I tell her a hundred times. If you don't leave a note, how's the night porter to know? Early call. <laughs> Is that all? I don't think much of that for a story. Oh, wait a minute, you haven't heard the story yet. <laughs> well, I hope it improves. <laughs> it was six o'clock on a winter's morning, pitch dark. I got up and put on the little lamp over the wash basin and got dressed. There wasn't a sound anywhere. I had a wash and I'd just started to shave when I saw something move in the looking glass. It made me jump and the razor nicked into my throat. The big door of the wardrobe had swung open and by a sort of double reflection I could see the bed behind me. On the edge of it sat a man in his shirt and trousers, a man with a great big moustache and the most terrible look of despair and fear on his face that I've ever seen or dreamt of. I stood paralysed, watching him in the mirror. I couldn't have turned round to save my life. Suddenly, he laughed. It was a horrid, silent laugh that showed all his teeth. They were very white and even. And the next moment, he cut his throat from ear to ear. There, before my eyes. Have... Have you ever seen a man cut his throat? The bed was all white before. 
when I could look round, I did. There was no one in the room. The bed was as white as ever. Well, could you throw down? Oh, no, I... Well, that's all. Except that now, of course, I understand how those other poor chaps had come by their deaths. They'd seen this horror, this ghost of Bert Hatteras, you know, and with, and with the shock, their hands must have slipped, like mine did, and they cut their throats before they could stop themselves. Oh, by the way, when I looked at my watch, it was two o'clock. There hadn't been any night porter at all. I must have dreamt that. But I didn't dream the other. Oh, yes. And another thing. It was the same room. They hadn't changed the furniture around. They just changed the numbers. It was the same room. I don't I'll, say. I'll, I'll just slip out for a moment. Uh, be back in a minute. Probably got to see if he can change his room. <laughs> Was my story as good as all that? <laughs> First rate. <laughs> the bit that doesn't ring true to me is uh, about those other chaps cutting their throats with a shock. I mean, they'd have had to be using cutthroat razors to do it. Oh, well, yes, I expect so. Well, there aren't many of these things about nowadays. Don't you believe it? I use one myself. Always have done. Nothing to touch them. Oh, do you think so? Swear by a cutthroat. Oh, well, oh, in any case, I mean, all this was some time ago. Uh, looking for you, you didn't. Ah, well, now we'll know. Uh, we reckoned you'd gone to ask for another room, old man. As a matter of fact, I have. What? Seriously? You know, they're moving my things straight away. Lucky for me, number four's had a cancellation. Well, don't tell us you were in number 16. I was. And it had that same furniture our friend here described. No. And that picture over the mantelpiece. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I am sorry. The cat's out of the bag, then. Yes, it was this hotel I was speaking of. Oh, well, what? I could do with the drink. Oh, no, no, I'll go. I want a word with the receptionist anyway. Going to ask them to move you into number 16, your old haunt. Oh, hey, hey, haunt! <laughs> yes, it happens, I am. You see, it's the best room in the house. I always try for it. What? You mean to say... As I said earlier, a chap ought to be able to make anything go. If he uses the right push. <laughs> well, I know. I'll bring the waiter back with me. It's the least I can do. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, you were going to say I was lucky not to cut my throat too. Well, I always use a safety razor. As a matter of fact, they're my line. It's safety razors. Uh, won't be a jiffy. David Kossoff in Number 17 by E. Nesbitt. It was produced by Charles Lefeu and adapted for the BBC by Michael and Molly Hardwick. <laughs>